Welcome to It's Our Money with Ellen Brown, a look behind the curtain of global finance and monetary control with one of the foremost experts in the field. Author of the bestseller Web of Debt and the Public Bank Solution, Ellen Brown's groundbreaking work began the movement to create new American public banks. We'll look at issues surrounding the world of money and the systems and powers that control it, as well as the progress being made on the public banking frontier. The program is underwritten by Public Banking Associates, a national consultancy of experts advising government leaders pursuing creation of their own public banks at publicbankingassociates.com. There is a war, and there's a war for who is going to get the economic surplus, who is going to end up with all the real estate and all of the wealth and all of the infrastructure. Will it be the wealthy 1% or will it be the public? Will it be the 99% benefiting from publicly owned infrastructure that provides health and education? Or will all of this vast public wealth, the public assets, be privatized, turned over to the financial sector, privatized and financialized and charging monopoly rents? If you listen to Michael Hudson long enough, you might think he's a pessimist about the prospect of our economic future. And you might be right. But one can't fault his historical knowledge and observation about how our money system works, who's working it, and who's getting worked by it. Hello, and welcome once again to It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. I'm Ellen's colleague, co-host, and senior advisor to the Public Banking Institute, Walt McCree. Today, we'll complete a conversation with Michael that Ellen started on our last program, in which he laid out the dynamics of monetary systems that rely on continuous circulation of money to maintain economic stability. When that circulation stops, it's very much like what happens to the human body when the blood stops. It stops functioning which is why austerity policies that start to show up at times like these when there's economic stress are a little like putting a tourniquet around a main artery. But, as Michael points out, this is actually what global financialists and corporatists propose by perpetuating massive and growing debt from which we cannot escape. We're even seeing that notion in the recent Fed attitude toward the states and cities of America that desperately need some generosity, some new money from our central bankers and our treasury. The COVID crisis has shrunk state and local revenues, which have to balance their budgets, and without some help from above, meaning the feds, they'll have to either raise taxes, go deeper into expensive debt, cut their services, and fire essential staff. It's a dystopic prospect for our governments. And it is unnecessary. When the truth of that reality hits home, and you observe the desperate condition of so many of our citizens, one's compelled to respond with both compassion and outrage. And so it is in America today that when we look around and see about half of our fellow citizens living near poverty, while we spend billions on bad things and give billions to bad players, there's building motion for change. On today's program, we'll touch down on that subject with Michael Hudson, and we'll also have a brief interlude on the same prospects with Greece's former financial minister, Yanis Varoufakis. And later on in the show, we'll talk with author of Screwnomics, Ricky Gard Diamond, whose economic theory, Screwnomics, is described by the notion that women should work for less or better for free. Ricky has a new article out in Ms. Magazine that asks whether public banking can help Black Lives Matter as well as women and women-owned businesses. Now, let's connect with Ellen, who has been actively writing about how the current policies of the Federal Reserve and the Treasury have upended old institutional precepts about banking that should be helpful to American states and cities, but so far hasn't been very helpful. It seems that the Fed and the Treasury haven't taken their eyes off how they can buoy private capital markets and big businesses. 
you know, your recent work has exposed the the role that BlackRock has uh, is playing in our national fiscal drama, um, and now you're focusing on this really important but little known aspect of the Federal Reserve's resources for banks, which is their discount window, and they're giving these virtually free loans to uh, banks and corporations and hedge funds and trading desks and so forth, but nothing for the states. What's that issue there? They're giving uh, virtually free loans to the banks. They're, they're trying to cut out the hedge funds and other, other entities that aren't in their purview. It looks to me like the reason they've done this, they threw open the discount window to all banks in good standing from zero to zero point two five percent, so almost nothing. But even if you're not in good standing, a bank not in good standing can borrow at zero point seven five percent. So that's very cheap and definitely much cheaper than the states can borrow at the um, municipal liquidity facility, which we've also talked quite a bit about and how the states are getting screwed on that because um, they have to borrow at the market rate plus a penalty. So nobody's going to go there. There are very few states that will even use it. Illinois, I guess, is using it because they're desperate. But So the Fed is really making no accommodations for the states and Congress isn't making much accommodation either. They, in their original CARES bill, they, it was by the time they were done, it came to three trillion dollars, and only five percent of that was allocated to all 50 states. And there were restrictions on what they could use it for. So they couldn't use it for their prior budget before March, which means virtually everything they do because they budget everything before they do it. So, like, the New Jersey governor was complaining that they might have to give the money back because they, you know, don't have uses for it. Meanwhile, they're they're really struggling. The states are liable to go bankrupt. And, in fact, Mitch McConnell, the Senate majority leader, said he'd rather see them go bankrupt. Of course, they're not legally allowed to go bankrupt. So what he'd rather do is make it so that they can go bankrupt, mainly because he wants to see them privatize their pension funds. And Larry Fink, the head of uh, BlackRock, which is now in charge of these two of these special purpose vehicles, he also is in favor of privatizing the pension funds. So the the states are really being discriminated against. You can make a case. I've seen the case made that this is intentional, that they want to bankrupt the states and the small businesses so that the big businesses and corporate America and uh, the big banks can scarf up the small businesses and we'll have a, basically a corporatocracy, a government run by big corporations. Right. The, and, the, and of course we saw that once before in the 2008 housing crisis, housing bubble, where uh, I guess BlackRock has become, and as a result of the foreclosure on the on the mortgages, uh, they've become the possessor of a good deal of the mortgage uh, holdings in the country. Uh, so we've certainly seen this story before. Well, <laughs> I agree. That's actually um, Blackstone that acquired all the real estate, but BlackRock, yes, oh, okay. Is. Okay. BlackRock Black was Stone. put in charge. <laughs> was put in charge of the. They got to be um, related, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, they are. BlackRock oh, is okay. an offspring, offshoot of Blackstone, although it's not connected now. But it it originated as uh, you know. I mean, Larry Fink yeah. was he came from Blackstone and and formed BlackRock. But anyway, so Black BlackRock in 2008 was put in charge of the Maiden Lane facilities, which were how the banks were able to get rid of their, t- or t- how th- it was actually for Bear Stearns and AIG, and they were able to get rid of their um, toxic assets by moving them onto this into these special purpose vehicles. So BlackRock, called Maiden Lane, so BlackRock was put in charge this time because they had that experience. But you know, it was no, a no bid contract. We the voters had absolutely nothing to do with it. And BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the world. They're bigger than the largest bank. I mean, they're they're huge, and they've got their fingers in everything. They've got a, along with the other two big asset managers, they've got a controlling interest in virtually all the major corporations in the country. 
so we've got a corporatocracy already pretty much yeah. and the question is how do we how do we break into that and the other question is why did the fed suddenly throw open its discount window when it it wasn't obvious that the banks were going down it wasn't like in 2008 where they were you know had a serious liquid, liquidity crisis and were going bankrupt but it looks to me like the reason was that they the banks actually had gone bankrupt, of course, in 2008, and their business model is bankrupt. In other words, they never have the money that they lend. The way they, the way they make loans is that they just create that money on their books. But then they have to balance their books at the end of the day. So if they don't get deposits in equal to the deposits they just created that went out, then they've got to borrow somewhere. And so that's where all these liquidity crises come from that sometimes the market freezes up and there's no place to borrow at a reasonable price. So in 2008, it was all about the money market funds and the repo market. And So after 2008, banks quit borrowing from each other because uh, they didn't trust each other, for one thing, to pay the loans back. And because the Fed started paying interest on excess reserves that went up at one point to 2.25%. So that was that's a quite nice interest rate just for doing absolutely nothing and letting your money sit at the Federal Reserve. So why take the risk of lending to other banks? So the banks went into the repo market instead, which is a private market, which is secured, supposedly, but it had problems as well, which I've also discussed on other shows. Um, And in September, interest rates in the repo market shot up to 10%, so the Federal Reserve felt compelled to step in because that's where its banks, you know, that are its province, uh, were borrowing. And so the Federal Reserve it, it was covering the repo market ever since. So by March, they were putting up up to a trillion dollars a day, making that much available in the repo market. And that meant that, you know, not just banks could get it, but hedge funds and other risky ventures that they didn't really mean to be making loans to. So it looks like the reason they threw up open their discount window was to get out of that having to backstep the repo market. So they just used the pandemic as an excuse or the, the freeze and said, well, we're going to free up liquidity for or free up credit for the local economies by making credit free to every, you know, all the banks and then they, they can they can do better terms on their loans into the local economy. But that didn't happen. They didn't do better terms. They didn't lower their credit card rates. Because they lowered it at half a percentage, but it's still up at around 21%. Uh, so that's the problem with the system. I mean, the good thing is the Fed has really covered the liquidity crisis problem, which is something that it's been a problem for hundreds of years. And by making the central bank's own liquidity available to all the banks for f- virtually for free, that solves that problem. But the, the problem is they didn't put any conditions on it. So the banks don't have to lower their interest rates. They don't have to lend to into local markets, and they don't. They, they use their money for other forms of investments or for lending to their big clients that are easier and, you know, quite likely to pay, not as risky, I suppose. So what needs to happen is that the banks that get this big benefit should have to serve the public interest. They should be public utilities, but we, the little people, don't really have the leverage to pull that off. But what we can do is set up state banks, which can also then borrow at the Federal Reserve virtually for free and not have to worry about liquidity crisis. That seems to be about the only option uh, since Congress has been so stingy, their latest round, uh, again, not providing uh, much more for states at all, uh, at least in the Republican part of the bill. The Democrats want to you know, put in three times uh, the amount. Basically, we have a, a situation where we need more money, and the, the people, the states, the cities can't get it unless they pay a penalty and high rates, but the banks can get it uh, really cheap. So here we have this systemic failure, or at least success, I suppose, if you're a corporatist, you know, uh, that only serves them and not us. And as you say, Ellen, the only way that we can get into that game is to have a bank, and that's what the public banking prospect offers it. It's so obvious. We've seen articles around the country where they're saying, hey, we, we need to have these banks now. 
Right. So California now has a new bill on AB 310, which would turn the California Infrastructure and Development Bank into a depository bank. There was, there was a bill on last year to that effect. It wound up in suspense, as they say. It didn't make it through the committees. So this new one would use 10% of the treasurer's investment pool as deposits. And so the treasurer's investment pool has almost $100 billion in it. So 10% would be $10 billion. So that would be a quite large bank. Right now, the, the Infrastructure and Development Bank has a lending loan pool of three hundred million. <laughs> so that's I see. that's gonna be, you know, thirty times what it's got right now. Wow. Um, and the concern of the treasurer was that uh, this puts the state's deposits at risk and they have other uses for their deposits, of course, especially right now. But the thing is, no matter what bank they put their deposits in, it's going to be the same arrangement where the bank will be using the deposits for loans and then they cover any shortfalls in liquidity by borrowing somewhere. So the treasurer wrote in her opposition to this new bill, she wrote... Often, Fed funds, large CDs, and brokered listed deposits are available only as long as a bank is willing and able to pay for their use. A bank may not be able to attain these non-core deposits if it becomes uncreditworthy, is restricted by law due to a weakened capital position, or is otherwise unable to pay above market rates. But that's the thing. That was before the Federal Reserve threw open its discount window at even for banks that were not in good standing, in other words, that are maybe not credit worthy, they'll still lend at 0.75%. So that's an extremely good rate. So I think the Fed has got that aspect covered. It's not actually risky. I mean, it's, a, it's always risky if you make loans that aren't going to get paid back. So you, you still have to you know, balance your books. But those toxic loans, now the Federal Reserve is buying all sorts of toxic assets off the banks as well, whether he would buy them from a public bank or it would buy them from a public bank, you know, remains to be seen. But definitely banking has become much, much less risky than it was. And the state's monies will be no less at risk by being in its in its own state-owned bank. The state's monies in its own state-owned bank will not be more at risk than in any other local bank or any other bank where, it, where it's kept. And uh, we would argue that it'll be less at risk because it's their own bank, so they know what the bank is doing. They can put parameters around it to make it definitely not risky. Yeah, it seems like the pandemic, the economic crisis that has resulted, uh, has put us into a whole different uh, frontier about managing our money, retaining it, having access to it. We have to have credit. Uh, Certainly our government seems to be uh, only serving one side of the the equation and letting the people uh, struggle. Uh, So hopefully there will be some significant changes in that department soon. Sorry to see that we, that Congress hasn't uh, been more generous in its last rounds uh, with this. But uh, the sto- game's not over. <laughs> the story's not over yet, unless they throw us into some, you know, major uh, depression or recession through the, through uh, austerity, through depriving us of the money that we need to to make our economy work. You know, it's uh, this started a revolution once before, I seem to recall. <laughs> Maybe yeah, it's time. well, we're seeing game changers all over the place. So that's why I write to point out what the new possibilities are here and that uh, we need to be aware and jump in and get our voices heard to make sure that it serves the people and not just big money. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for for doing all the hard writing (laughs) and thinking, too, Helen. Um, (laughs) So we're talking to um, an an old colleague of ours in just a a minute about the impact that uh, public banking could have on some of the uh, effects of COVID, uh, of the COVID economy, and also on Black Lives Matter and on women and so forth. So let's go do that. All right. Thanks.
Michael Hudson opened this program with a comment about a virtual war that is underway globally between financial interests and institutions and the public's interest and needs. His bold assertion deserves some further characterization and expansion, which is what we'll be doing now with a continuation of the conversation that Ellen had with Michael on our last program. Michael's world renown as an economist, archaeologist, professor, banking expert makes his claims important, if difficult, to hear. His comments are no nonsense, tell it like it is, matter of factness, that what the world is going through economically is not just some business cycle or coincidental cataclysm caused by a pandemic. We're actually witnessing an intentional agenda that has been foist upon the people of the world by a financial oligarchy that has enslaved virtually all of us with debt bondage. Debt is the leg iron applied to all citizens and nations where money is privately controlled as a commodity rather than deployed as a public utility. Let's take a deeper look at this by rejoining Ellen's conversation with Michael Hudson. So, said uh, the debts that have been built up are being used as a warfare tactic. The pandemic crisis has created a battlefield with the rules written by the financial sector. So, could you explain that a little bit? I thought that was a very good image. Well, somebody has to lose. And uh, uh, if you're unemployed and uh, you can't afford to, or if you're laid off, you can't afford to pay the mortgage or pay your rent, then you end up uh, homeless and uh, you default. And uh, essentially the white people are ending up like uh, the blacks and Hispanics under uh, Obama. They're kicked out of their uh, homes. And uh, that's basically uh, uh, the the trade-off. There is a war, and there's a war for who is going to get the economic surplus and who is going to end up with all the real estate and all of the wealth and all of the infrastructure. Will it be the wealthy 1% or will it be the public the uh, domain? Will it be the 99% benefiting from publicly owned infrastructure uh, that provides uh, health and education either freely or at subsidized prices? Or will it, all of this vast public wealth, the public assets, be privatized, turned over to the financial sector, privatized and financialized and charging monopoly rent. So uh, you have, it's uh, very much like the military invasions that took over uh, England and France in the uh, 11th century, Uh, except this time it's not done militarily. It's done purely financially and legally and ideologically by trying to convince people that there's no alternative, that this is how the world works. And it's not really how the world has to work. Of course, there's an alternative. Uh, But if you believe that uh, there's no alternative except feudalism, except going back to create a wealthy ruling class, lording it over the rest of society, then you're not going to protest. Uh, You're not going to uh, uh, create a different kind of a government. You're going to say, well, that's capitalism, and there's no alternative. And, of course, it's not capitalism. It's finance capitalism turning into neo-feudalism. So there's a kind of uh, junk economics that crowds out uh, reality economics, and uh, there's a kind of uh, Orwellian vocabulary that goes uh, with all this to try to uh, trick people into thinking you can't do anything about it, so just please uh, uh, give up your house. Uh, for, uh, uh, forfeit uh, your property, accept lower wages, and uh, think that this is how nature works, and it's all a natural law. And, of course, it isn't a natural law. It's a takeover. Right, and they'll blame it on, like, the plague or just say it's one of those things that happens every century or so. And that's that's right. They'd love to blame it. it on the plague, even though all that the coronavirus did was it was uh, catalyze uh, the culmination of uh, this uh, debt buildup that was occurring ever since 1945, but especially since 1980. Right, and and the Federal Reserve bailed out the banks all the way back in September. I mean, we could have said then, if we, <laughs> Congress could have said then, you guys are bankrupt and we're going to, you know, either I'll, we'll take you over, but the deal is that we're not just going to pay off your debts and give you back to the private investors. Uh, we want you to be a public utility. They could, that's what we were, 
different people had written that, that the next time this happens, we need to nationalize the banks. You know, we need to put some conditions on bailing them out. But we didn't get that chance because the Federal Reserve just took it upon itself to backstop the repo market. And then in March, they just flung open their doors and dropped the interest rate to 0.25% for all banks in good standing. Um, and nobody, you know, we did, Congress didn't get to argue about it about this bailout. So I don't see but, where we have any leverage to force them into bankruptcy. The problem is that uh, the Federal Reserve and central banks in general are part of the class war. The Federal Reserve should not have been created and needn't have been created. Uh, when it was created in 1913, it was created specifically for Wall Street to take over the Treasury. To uh, The Treasury had been doing everything that the Federal Reserve uh, had been doing. It had been uh, managing the money supply. It had been distributing money throughout the country. Uh, I've written articles on my website uh, on this. Uh, the uh, central banks are created to take monetary policy out of the public domain, out of the Treasury, out of electoral politics, and to make it part of unelected politics. Uh, creating the Federal Reserve is the number one policy of oligarchy. Once you create a central bank that is independent from politics, uh, you've uh, essentially moved from democracy to oligarchy. And that was the intention of uh, J.P. Morgan when he and his fellow bankers uh, designed the Federal Reserve specifically to exclude Washington. Washington and the Treasury weren't even allowed on the Federal Reserve Board as it was first uh, structured. It was Franklin Roosevelt who uh, uh, put the uh, Treasury back on. So basically, all of the functions that are performed by the Federal Reserve today and used to be before, performed by the Treasury should be returned to the Treasury, and the Treasury should manage the money supply in the public interest and credit and loans uh, and extend credit for purposes that are deemed to be in the public interest, not uh, the Federal Reserve, which is independent and antithetical to the public interest, directly averse to the public interest. The, uh, the in, inherent policy of the Federal Reserve is to create a depression. That is what debt deflation is. Uh, uh, as long as you have the Federal Reserve and a privatized banking system, you are mathematically creating uh, the dynamics of exponential debt growth leading to a permanent debt peonage for the economy permanent until there's a change in the system, and the system can only be changed uh, from without. Um, I, I was thinking about on the, the war analogy, if we really were at war and the government, the federal government said, all right, you stop everything you're doing and start making weapons, and we'll pay you for it. And, and then we paid the people the same amount that they were making at their jobs, I, we would not consider that inflationary. I mean, that's, we're just, and of course they're making weapons that are just going to blow up. They're not creating food or anything, any kind of consumer goods that people need. Or it's just like Roosevelt said about digging ditches and, and filling them back up. It doesn't matter what you put the workers to work on. The, the idea is to get money into the real economy and that that is what stimulates the economy and that it's not inflationary till you run out of supplies. So I suppose since we have this lockdown, which is, you know, forced by the federal government, then, I mean, it seems to me that the government is responsible for paying all the damages for forcing that on the people. <laughs> Well, but, uh, philosophically, you could say that, but the, uh, the uh, role of the banking system is not to put money into the hands of the population. It's to put debt into the hands of the population yeah. and extract interest and fees. Uh, credit mm -hmm. card companies make more money from penalty fees than they make an in interest, and that's because the interest rate is something like uh, uh, maybe 11% uh, uh, officially, but then the penalty fees are 29%. So much more money is made by uh, make driving the economy bankrupt than is made by a thriving uh, economy, at least for the financial sector and for the banks. So the financial sector makes most of its money by bankrupting the economy. That's the dynamics, and that's what economic model building should be all about, 
but uh, the economic models that are used in the mainstream leave debt uh, out of account, and it's as if the whole economy works on barter. It's like uh, talking about debt today is like talking about sex 100 years ago. Uh, it's more repressed than anything Freud talked about. <laughs> anything except talking about vaccines. So, so it seems like we're sort of stuck. Uh, like you say, they, don't, they, whoever they are, don't want to save the economy. They want to exploit the economy, and they're perfectly happy to have it be going the way it is because it's an opportunity to snatch up all the real assets like they do every time we have a boom and bust cycle. So we really are at war in the sense that we really have to use all our weapons. So, of course, our argument at the Public Banking Institute is that we should set up public banks and then we can use those facilities that the Federal Reserve has set up for public banks. It looks to me, now that any bank in good standing can borrow for free, does that mean you don't really need deposits, that you can pretty much cover your liquidity just by going right to the Federal Reserve? I mean, they got rid of the reserve requirement, and they're going easy on the capital requirement. They say, well, capital is for an emergency, and this is an emergency. So yes, banks don't it. need deposits at all. That's the essence of modern monetary theory. There's a popular impression that banks lend out money uh, that people have saved up. But uh, that's not what they do at all. Re uh, remember what I spoke about earlier here. If you go into a bank uh, and uh, want to take out a mortgage or to buy stocks and bonds, or uh, if you want to borrow a billion dollars to uh, raid a company and fire the workers, th the bank will simply create the money and lend to you. The bank doesn't say, well, we have to wait for somebody to save that money to lend to you. They just create it electronically. It's not dropped out of helicopters. It's created electronically on computers. Uh, and uh, we'll create the money an asset and a liability. Uh, our asset is your IOU. Uh, our liability is uh, to your uh, bank account that now you can spend uh, the billion dollars to take over a company, fire the workers, uh, reopen the company in Vietnam or China, and uh, uh, import uh, goods to uh, unemploy and undersell uh, American uh, industry. That's why we've deindustrialized. Uh, Deindustrialization is the byproduct of financialization and privatization. If you financialize and you privatize, you cannot industrialize because you'll become so high cost of having to pay debt service in the fire sector that you can't afford to compete with uh, countries that have not committed financial suicide uh, in the way that the United States and England have done. Wow, that's a very good point. So the banks are always running into liquidity crises, as they say, because they're pretending to lend the deposits, but they don't really have the deposits. So if the depositors come for their money and the borrowers come at the same time, they've got to scramble around to get the money. So they used to borrow from each other, and then they quit because they um, didn't trust each other and because the Fed started paying interest on excess reserves. So what was the point? They were already making money just by leaving it at the Fed. And then they started borrowing at the repo market, and then that collapsed for liquidity reasons. So it's always this liquidity thing. Uh, so am I right, though, that the Fed has now just made liquidity like free? Any bank yes. can just say, yeah. The Fed is, in effect, the depositor that has made up the gap. If the banks need money, uh, the, uh, the Fed uh, creates it. Right, so that's something we need to capitalize on by forming our own, bank, our own banks. That's yes, if the Fed can argument. do it to, to finance the 1%, getting enormously rich, why can't it uh, create uh, a similar wealth for the 99%? Why can't it uh, create industrialization instead of deindustrialization? Why can't it create uh, infrastructure instead of uh, uh, in, uh, just buying out existing infrastructure and charging more money uh, for uh, transportation and railroads and subways that are falling apart? Uh, why, why can't an economy be run more rationally? Or in other words, why is China pulling ahead and we're not? Right. Yeah, totally agree. All right. So just we're <laughs> coming up to more than the end of our time. Um, so do you have any closing words you want to wrap up with? Uh, I don't know what I can say. Message. Is, is, uh, message. Uh, the, uh, the question is whether we really have a debt problem or whether it's a quandary. Uh, a, a problem has a solution. 
uh, a quandary doesn't have a solution. And I don't see any solution that can be done within the given electoral system uh, and the given political system. If the political system is now run by the donor class, and if the Republicans and Democrats are merging, and uh, Biden says, I'm going to uh, work across the aisle just like Obama did, we're going to get rid of Social Security, we're going to throw the elderly out in the street, we're going to evict uh, uh, the people who vote for us, uh, and we're going to uh, support the kind of racist policies that we've been supporting ever since uh, Clinton, then uh, uh, you can imagine what kind of society we're going to have. When similar policies like this were done in Greece or in Latvia, uh, the Latvians emigrated. The Greeks emigrated, or they committed suicide. Lifespans shortened. Uh, but where will the Americans go? Will they be willing to die quietly, to uh, commit suicide? There's nowhere they can go. They don't speak foreign languages. Uh, where will the Americans emigrate to when there are no jobs and they've lost their houses? Yeah, they'll go to Mexico. I saw a joke about that, something about are you coming in or going out? <laughs> well, they'd better learn Spanish. Something like that, yeah. Well, it's been wonderful talking to you, as always. The same here. Okay, great. All right, I've been speaking with Michael Hudson, who has written over two dozen books, including Killing the Host and Forgive Them Their Debts. I'm going to do something a little different for our show now something I'll call a little Michael Hudson rejoinder interlude by bringing in the voice of one of his friends, uh, whom he's helped back in 2015 during the Greek economic crisis. I'm talking about Greece's former finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis. Varoufakis has gained an international following for his clear and outspoken counsel on economic realities, both in the EU and across the world of private capital. He has been leading a populist political agenda in Europe to re-democratize, as he would say, the European Union, which he has repeatedly said is on the brink of survival. One of the reasons is that its economic system has undermined the integrity of each country's natural economic stability and integrity by conjoining these disparate nation-states into a centralized bureaucracy and a centralized monetary control system, which is essentially controlled by powerful financial interests. In this way, the peoples of Europe have been saddled with economic and monetary programs that don't reach the interests of the people and have undermined many of their countries' economies. Observers think that these are pivotal days for the EU. Varoufakis and his colleagues at DM25, which stands for Democracy in Europe 2025, are beginning to take their places in the halls of EU politics, and they're facing the long odds of taking on the massive capital machine of central banks and their political controls. The short section of a commentary that I'm going to play now is borrowed from Double Down News, a Eurocentric media channel, and it captures Giannis talking about capitalism in a rather provocative way. But it speaks to the comments that Michael Hudson just expounded upon with Ellen, that the global financial oligarchy has created a system that leaves the welfare of people out of its mission. Let's listen to a few minutes of Yanis Varoufakis as he outlines our capitalism predicament. Capitalism is a remarkable system. On the one hand, it produces remarkable wealth and fantastic technologies by which to create more wealth. And on the other hand, it creates new forms of depravity, humiliation, poverty, hopelessness. So hopelessness and poverty and iPhones being created by the same production line. That's capitalism. It's a system that produces its own crisis that constantly undermines itself. And when there is a crisis, whole generations of people are thrown into the dustbin of history. Since our generation's 1929, which of course took place in 2008, the number one task of the establishment was to shift the bankers' losses onto the shoulders of the weakest citizens. 
effectively transfer huge wealth to the bankers from the have-nots. But austerity leads to very low levels of demand, which leads to very low levels of investment. So you give all this money to the bankers, whether you've printed it or actually transferred it, they look at the plebs out there, they realize that oh, these people can't buy their stuff, so they don't invest in production. So what they do is they use the money that has been transferred to them and they buy back their own shares. So their assets go up, share prices, bonuses, and so on. House prices go through the roof. And at the same time, there's no investment. So this contributes to humanity's failure to do anything about climate change, because unless you invest in green technologies, it won't happen. And it also contributes to the perpetuation of the economic disaster that then requires more austerity. But in order to continue along the lines of this catastrophic route, you need more doses of authoritarianism in order to impose those idiotic policies on the many. You have the nationalist international on the one hand and the international of horror on the other, the bankers, large corporations, and a political class that has been fed by those oligarchs, groomed by them, lobotomized by them, and of course the media that are owned by the same oligarchs, whose job is to peddle the views of the establishment. So we need to reclaim liberty when it comes to economic decision making. Now nobody has any decision making powers or freedom or choice, except for the very, very few who have the capacity to transfer their losses onto the shoulders of everyone else. But um, we have no right uh, to be empirical about it. Unlike the weather, which is independent of what we think about, history is made by people who don't give a damn about predictions and who do what they think is right. We need to reclaim control of our financial freedom. That was Yanis Varoufakis, with thanks to Double Down News. Might public banks have something to contribute to the discussion of Black Lives Matter? And is there an intersection of that concern with a similar category of citizens who have been shut out or had their economic and monetary privileges restricted, namely women? Our next guest was recently featured in Ms. Magazine with an article discussing just those concerns. Ricky Gard Diamond, the author of Screwnomics, the economic theory that women should work for less or better for free, raised the discussion in an article titled How Public Banking Could Make Black Lives Matter. Ricky was a colleague of Ellen and me on the Public Banking Institute Board of Directors a few years back. In her new Ms. article, she cites new Pew data that white families have 13 times the wealth of black families, a gap that exists at every educational level. The racial imbalance added to capitalism's inherent inequities have made this reflective moment in America's history even clearer. Whether from the redlining of black neighborhoods, their increased costs of lending and decreased values of real estate, there's a long list of infractions. The banking world has been part and parcel of keeping black lives down. Ricky's authoring of Screwnomics revealed how women have been systemically undermined through the years in very specific policy ways. And now, with Black Lives Matter consciousness emerging, the whole spectrum of banking's role in our society is coming into better focus. Public banks, in fact, do have something to contribute. Ellen and I spoke with Ricky about how her work has evolved in recent years and why women's realities make a good springboard for a wider lens to see the real landscape of banking's impact on disenfranchised communities of color and gender. Women know that the economy is relevant to them, but I think for the most part, uh, they're they're jumping on board what already existed, and, and women had very little to do, if anything, to do with uh, the institutions that are now, um, you know, accepted as part of the economy and dominated by Wall Street and, and Washington, where money continues to speak in a male voice, largely. And that wasn't so long ago that women were barred from you know, earning their own paychecks or owning property or having their own bank accounts. So I want women to to remember that. And the uh, alliance that Ellen and I are both part of, the um, an economy of our own, which is focused on um, highlighting brilliant leadership like Ellen and like Leanne Eisler and, and like 
women who are writing books and organizing new institutions and just wanting to make the economy better for everyone because right now most of us are screwed no matter what uh, your actual gender or sexual preference. So, yeah, you've discussed how public banking can help black lives and black lives matter. Uh, do, do you want to go into that? I mean, they've definitely been disadvantaged by the whole banking situation, and they yeah. struggled to form their own banks, but that's very difficult. Community banks always have a hard time. So uh, do you want to go into your thinking on that? I, I want to, first of all, praise one of your advisory board members, um, Mirsa Baradaran, who uh, is a delightful person for starters, um, a brilliant legal mind, and a wonderful writer who wrote a book called The Color of Money. And she's now on the Public Banking Advisory Board, and more power to you. I mean, she's terrific. And I read the book, and I found that any, I, I've always thought that reparations were needed, uh, but after reading her book, wow, I, I really think so. I think public banking is part of the answer for uh, black communities, but um, I also think with her that the cruel tricks that I wasn't even able to get into in the article that I wrote for Ms. Magazine are, are just shameful and uh we just uh we owe a great deal to the community whose labor we've benefited from and still are and who are you know brave citizens of this country they're insisting on equal rights and uh that certainly includes the right to uh own a beautiful home in a suburb um and not be discriminated against for wanting that but that certainly hasn't been true for independent black banks that community banks end up losing money on the property that they own. Mirza had said that public banking could uh, help because the community banks are just too small and, you know, it's just too hard for them. Um, do you want to yeah. go to that? Or, yeah, go ahead. Well, I think one of the things I learned was that when one of the the – um, drawbacks of community banking and being a special uh, bank with one of the drawbacks for them is that if they try to raise capital outside their own community, uh, then they no longer qualify for being a community bank any longer. And so it's kind of a catch-22 no matter what they do. And we're looking at cities that have been abandoned in many ways and ex exploited by police surveillance and fines and bail and all, all those kinds of tricks that, that have shortchanged black families, black and brown families. You've conflated two big, important minority groups, women and blacks, African Americans in America, as uh, recipients uh, of the short end of the stick relative in banking. And as you pointed mm -hmm. out, quite remarkably, it's only been a matter of maybe four or five decades that women were able to have their own uh, bank accounts and their own credit cards. But as we know through the history of America, that the black families have been cut out of so many of the financial services and that the community banks in those uh, communities have, have disappeared. Well, how does a public bank serve that? How do you see public banks coming to the rescue for both of those groups? Well, a public bank is rooted in, in the neighborhood, uh, in the state or the, in the city that has such a bank. And uh, black families pay taxes and pay fees, driver's license fees, and that's the kind of public money then that could be pooled and used to capitalize a public bank. Ideally, they would also be seated on the bank board and have something to say about what the priorities of a particular city are. And I'm thinking right now of Philadelphia in particular, which, you know, you've got uh, one of your board members, uh, Emma Chappelle, is from Philadelphia, from that area. It's still a, a hard place to live for people of color. Uh, one of our board members is working hard to promote cooperative businesses, that, a new form of ownership of businesses and a, a different philosophy than most businesses in the United States. And so I think combining 
those interests as well would be really helpful to most often women do want to have uh, more cooperative relationships. They're not uh, waging the economy as, as war and winning. They, they, they want to have a, a good neighborhood and a good state and a, a friendly place to live and a peaceable place to live. And I think women serving on that public banking board in that city, in that state, would make a big difference. Yeah, I would add that, I mean, the difference between a public bank, or two differences, one is that uh, the public bank actually has a mandate to serve the public. So the Wall Street Bank yes. could do it, they just don't have any interest in doing it. And the community banks don't have the wherewithal. You know, I mean, the community black banks obviously will try to do it and have tried to do it. Um, but, for example, Mirsa is heavily into postal banking. That's a, a giant network. So, the, obviously, mm-hmm. the, the federal government has a lot of resources that a local community bla- black bank wouldn't have. And I just, in the earlier part of, of our show, discussed the fact that the Federal Reserve has opened up its discount window to all banks. Um, banks in good standing get, get to borrow at 0.25%. No, no stigma. Uh, you know, it used to always there used to be a stigma attached, but now they anybody can or any bank in good standing can do that, and even banks that aren't in good standing can borrow at 0.75 percent. So you've got the ability now to go right to the trough and get virtually free credit, and public banks or local community banks would uh, have the incentive to actually pass those benefits on to the local community. Plus, of course, they cut out all the, all the middlemen, so they, they save money, and then in that way they can uh, save, uh, pass on uh, cheaper loans as well. Mm-hmm. The cheaper credit is really important, but I think another important piece of public banking is the uh, trust that it builds uh, in, in communities. And, and I think we have a kind of, shortfall in in trust these days and it wouldn't hurt at all to have more collaboration and more cooperation on public service of the kind a public bank can provide. Yeah, good point. Yeah, the banking frontier has changed because of our of our work in public banking. It brings to the table the voices that have not had any power or any place to stand, as you point out, having women on boards of directors uh, would certainly empower and shape the way that a public bank could work. But two, both blacks and women have been receiving the strongest of, uh, negative effects of this COVID crisis. For a variety of reasons, their jobs, their lives uh, are at greater risk. And so presumably, and really intentionally, in the California bill that Ellen just mentioned, uh, there's a very deliberate uh, allotment and targeting of minority banks, of, of women-owned businesses, of cooperative businesses, all of the things that the ideas and of the emerging systems and mechanics that we want to see as people, people being the public. So I think it's very exciting that you've created, uh, helped to create this this frontier for women to participate actively and look more closely at how economics disadvantages them and how they can grab hold of new levers. Yes, and I'm so happy to hear about what's happening in California because it is something that needs to happen across the nation because uh, women are, are uh, shortchanged, but black women in particular are, are very much shortchanged, and they're powerful leaders. We, we see that in our communities, too. And to, you know, to plug in that kind of powerful, spirited leadership into banking, wow, it would be a good thing for all of us, I think. Right. Absolutely. Well, Ricky, thank you. We've uh, appreciate the time uh, for your sharing this uh, uh, this growing field. Um, I think you know, all citizens in America have been moved to the front lines of concern about yes. how we're going to protect and uh, systemically uh, and collectively our families and our communities. Time to take that take the power back. And women, <laughs> women are doing a great job so far. <laughs> Well, so is the public banking uh, movement. I, I'm, I'm just excited about what's happening in California and, and the whole movement. It's just great to see it. That's Ricky Gard Diamond, author of Screwnomics, the economic theory that women should work for less or better for free. 
Well, that's it for this edition of It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. Our thanks to our guests, our sponsor, Public Banking Associates, and to you for listening. Be sure to check out Ellen's latest writings on the economy and the changing world of money by visiting ellenbrown.com. And for more information on public banking, visit publicbankinginstitute.org. For information on how local and state government leaders can obtain professional insight and counsel about public banks from key national experts, visit publicbankingassociates.com. I'm Walt McCree. See you next time on It's Our Money with Ellen Brown.